All right. So uh, my talk today is about humanistic Buddhism in Singapore, and uh, I hope to give you a quick, uh, in fact, a, a quick and brief overview of the historical development and history of the uh, of humanistic Buddhism in my country. And it's also something that I have been very passionate about, uh, something that I've, I've been thinking uh, uh, for the last, I would say, maybe 10 years, uh, looking at uh, your, uh, religious change and modernization of Buddhist community, not only in Singapore, but in the broader Southeast Asian region. It's very interesting. I want to start my lecture today by talking about two interesting misconceptions and stereotypes of Buddhists in Singapore. I think very often people think about Buddhists, I, I think, uh, uh, in the, with this two F, you know. So what are this two F? I think these are the two very common misconceptions that some people have about Buddhists. First F is they often think about Buddhists in terms of forest. They think about Buddhists as people who always meditate, you know, uh, quietly in a faraway place, maybe in the forest. So I think this is one of the very common misconception that some people have about Buddhists, that they go to very far away places, isolated from others to practice meditation, you know, somewhere you know, far away in the forest. But uh, obviously, uh, as what I'm going to uh, share with you today in my uh, talk, this is uh, definitely not the case in Singapore. And second, another even more interesting uh, misconception or stereotype about Buddhists, especially in the Singapore context, is another F which is funeral. <laughs> and this is often, you know, some, uh, some common perception that people only invite monks uh, and nuns or monastic to, you know, to, to come is only for funeral, to conduct rites for funeral. So this is also another very common misconception, especially in the Singapore context. I, I don't know if uh, you are familiar with uh, Singapore's uh, HDB, or we call it the you know our kind of public uh public housing or public uh flats. So at the bottom, at the first level of the HDB apartment is known as the void deck, and usually the funerals are being conducted at the void deck. So very often people see monastic you know chanting for for funerals. So I, and this is this kind of image I think is some common also I would say stereotype misconception about Buddhism and monastic in Singapore that you they tend to associate Buddhism with funeral. And again, in my lecture today, I'm going to share that you know, this is again not the case, that we are going to learn more about humanistic Buddhism in Singapore. And of course, when we think about humanistic Buddhism, we are thinking about Buddhism for this life and this worldly, you know, uh, for, for this world, uh, worldly context. So we're going to move away from this stereotype to understand how humanistic Buddhism is being promoted and practiced in the Singapore context. So I'm going to start with a very brief introduction about my talk today. As I mentioned earlier, my talk is going to offer a brief history of humanistic Buddhism in Singapore. And in fact, to this lecture, I'm going to cover you know, as long as about 100 years of development uh, from the 19, about 20s to the present. Uh, yeah, exactly about 100 years. So uh, because of the uh, interest of time, we're going to touch and go a bit. I, I, I do not have you know, the, the time and the opportunity to cover every single organization. So I will focus on some of the more important ones and also to give you a better sense of you know, how humanistic Buddhism is like in the Singapore context. Uh, and my talk today will be divided into three parts. I'm going to examine the development, the history and development of humanistic Buddhism in three phases. First, I'm going to talk about uh, Master Taishi's idea of human life Buddhism and how human life Buddhism came to Singapore. And actually, this contributed to the transformation and change of the Buddhist community in Singapore as early as in the 1920s. Next, I'm going to talk about uh, Venerable Yen Pei's idea of humanistic Buddhism and how Venerable Yen Pei, as you see over here uh, on, uh, on the slide, he was uh, one of the very early uh, Buddhist teachers that actually promoted humanistic Buddhism in Singapore before uh, the third phase that I'm going to talk more about are the emergence of humanistic Buddhist organizations in contemporary Singapore. And of course, when we think about humanistic Buddhist organizations in contemporary Singapore, we are going to look at some of the, the arrival of uh, humanistic Buddhist groups from Taiwan and how they arrived in Singapore and localized to promote humanistic Buddhism in the local context. So I'm going to also talk about that in the third part of my lecture today. 
So let's start with uh, Master Tai Chi. And of course, this is something that, you know, often when we think about, you know, humanistic Buddhism, uh, one of the very important thinkers and founders, you know, of, of this uh, thought has uh, to do with uh, Master Tai Chi. And I'm going to share a bit with you uh, about uh, some background about uh, Master Tai Chi and about how his ideas came to Singapore. So uh, as some of you might already be very familiar, Master Tai Chi was one of the most prominent uh, Buddhist reformers and in fact, Buddhist thinkers in modern Chinese history. He was the, a very important uh, reformer that actually came out with the, uh, the, we've promoted this idea of a Buddhist revitalization movement during the Republican period in China. Master Tai Chi was born in 1890 in, uh, in Zhejiang, and he became a novice in Jiangsu. And that was uh, and later on, he received his higher ordination at the Tiantong Monastery in Ningbo. After he was, uh, after he received his higher ordination, he and some other prominent monks, including uh, Master Hui Quan and Master Yuan Ying, they all received their monastic training in the Tiantong Monastery in Ningbo under the tutelage of Master Ji Chan. And uh, Master Ji Chan was a very prominent Buddhist teacher uh, in Republican, uh, in the late Qing and Republican period. And his nickname was known as the Ba Zi Tou Tuo, or the Eight Finger Sage. Eight Finger Sage. And the reason why he's called the Eight Finger Sage or Ba Zi Tou was because he only has eight fingers because he actually burned his hand as a way, as a, a part of his Buddhist sato vow to, uh, to devote his life to public get the Dharma. So that's why he burned his hand and he only left with eight fingers. And so that's the nickname that was given to him was the Eight Finger Sage. And he was one of the very prominent Buddhist teachers in the late Qing and the early Republican period. And he taught some of the very important uh, Buddhist uh, teachers at that time, including Master Tai Chi, Hui Quan, and Yuan Ying. And subsequently, uh, Master Tai Chi uh, uh, furthered his studies under prominent lay uh, Buddhist scholars Yang Wenhui. Uh, Yang Wenhui was one of the very prominent Buddhist uh, scholars uh, during the Republican period, uh, during the late Qing and Republican period. And he was the one who actually established the uh, Jetavana Hermitage or the Zihuan uh, Jingse in Nanjing to actually promote the academic study of Buddhism. And because of his uh, prominent, uh, his prominent uh, intellectual uh, promotion of Buddhism, he actually attracted many other intellectuals and scholars to come and teach Buddhism and, with him. And one of them was Su Man Su, who was a very important intellectual in the late Qing and early Republican period. So Su Man Su uh, is often known as the, the poet monk because he was also a very prominent poet. And he wrote a lot of very interesting romance poem before he was ordained became a monk. And uh, so uh, at the uh, Jatavana Hermitage, Master Tai Chi studied Buddhist doctrines uh, uh, with uh, Yang Wenhui. And he actually studied uh, uh, English with Su Man Su. Uh, and of course, Su Man Su was a very international uh, intellectual. So he actually spent time in, uh, not only in Europe, but in Japan to study Buddhism. And, and he was one of the prominent thinkers of the time. So after studying at the uh, Jatavana Hermitage, uh, Master Tai Chi actually was inspired to actually start uh, to spearhead the Buddhist revival movement in Republican China. And of course, if you're familiar with Chinese history, uh, the year 1911 was a very prominent year in China. That was the year of the, uh, you know, the uh, Wuchang uh, uprising, the, the Xinhai uh, revolution that actually led to the fall of the Qing dynasty and the establishment of the, uh, of the Republic of China. So that actually, this uh, the revolution also motivated, inspired Master Tai Chi, and he realized that how revolution is not only about politics, but it's also about religion. So he wanted to revolutionize Buddhism at the time, and he and that actually inspired him to spearhead the Buddhist revival movement or the Fu Jiao Fu Xing Yun Dong. And a question to ask is what exactly did he want to revive at that time? And of course, at that time, he was exactly trying to clear the stereotype of the so-called 2F that I was talking about earlier, about you know, Buddhism as someone you know, being you know, uh, uh, isolated or self-cultivation, but more importantly about Buddhism as funeral, because during the late Qing and early years of the Republican period, the stereotypical image of Buddhists 
was that Buddhist only uh, Buddhist monastic was about you know conducting funerals uh, about you know promoting the afterlife rather than teaching Buddhism for the, the this worldly living. So this was something that Master Tai Chi wanted to change. So that was the reason why he pro promoted this idea of a Buddhist revival movement to revolutionize and to reform Chinese Buddhism. And, and he advocated also for the need to reform the monastic system and promote education. And this is something he thought was extremely important. Because again, he thought that many monastic at the time were not interested in promoting Buddhist teachings and they were not interested to teach the Dharma. In fact, many of them were just busy making money from conducting funeral rituals and, and uh, performing, uh, performing ceremonies at temples. And he realized that uh, he need, he, at the time, he had to reform the monastic system to train a group of scholarly monks uh, to be able to propagate the Dharma and to promote Buddhist education. So that was something that he thought he wanted to do. And therefore, in 1922, he founded the Wuchang Buddhist Institute, the Wuchang Fu Yuan, as a center, as you can see uh, the image on your right there, there was uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, a photograph of the Wuchang Buddhist uh, Institute. He wanted to, to establish an institute to train young monastic to propagate the Dharma and to reform Chinese Buddhism. So that, that was why he thought it was so important to set up a Buddhist Institute of Fu Yuan. And, and this is something very interesting. It's a very important shift away from the earlier uh, kind of uh, Buddhist kind of monastic uh, temple system that tend to emphasize on conducting Buddhist ceremonies and rites to changing that to a kind of Buddhist Institute to promote Buddhist teachings and to train young monastics. And a year later, he became an inaugural president of the World Buddhist Fellowship. So at that time, Master Tai Chi also realized that it's very important for Buddhists not to be isolated uh, to themselves, but to be connected with the Buddhist communities around the world. So he has a, this global ecumenical vision of connecting with Buddhist communities in all other places. So he thought that it's important to have a World Buddhist Fellowship to connect different Buddhist groups, different monastics, different organizations around the world through his World Buddhist Fellowship. And in 1927, uh, Master Tai Chi was elected to, to uh, succeed uh, Hui Quan, who was his uh, former classmate, as you learned earlier, uh, to be the abbot of Nam Pu Tuo Monastery. And of course, Nam Pu Tuo Monastery, if you uh, have been to uh, Xiamen University in, uh, in uh, Fujian, you know that uh, the Nam Pu Tuo Monastery in Xiamen is just right next to Xiamen University. The Nam Pu Tuo uh, Monastery was one of the, and uh, it still is one of the most prominent Buddhist monastery in southern China. And, uh, and Tai Xu was actually uh, elected to become the successor, to be the abbot of the Nam Pu Tuo Monastery. But more importantly, he was also uh, asked to be the rector of the Mingnan Buddhist Institute, the Mingnan Fu and that was established by uh, Master Hui Xuan uh, earlier. So he became the abbot and the rector of this very important Buddhist center in Southern China. And as you can see the image uh, on the right, that is the uh, photograph of the Mingnan Fu Yuan in Republican China, uh, in, in China. And this photograph was taken much later. This is in, uh, in uh, 1985. So uh, of course the Mingnan Buddhist Institute uh, was closed during the um, Chinese Cultural Revolution. And he has been revived again uh, in the post Mao era. And it continues to be a very important center for Buddhist studies in China today. So Master Tai Chi, one of the very important ideas that Master Tai Chi uh, advocated was this idea of human life Buddhism or Ren Shen Fu Jiao. And of course, some uh, scholars uh, suggest that human life Buddhism or Ren Shen Fu Jiao is the kind of the prototype of humanistic Buddhism because Master Tai Chi uh, was a very prominent teacher and he influenced a generation of monastics uh, with his idea of human life Buddhism or Ren Shen Fu Jiao and how this idea gradually developed to become what we now know as uh, Ren Jian Fu Jiao or humanistic Buddhism today. So according to Master Tai Chi, human life Buddhism or Ren Shen Fu Jiao was a very 
it's, it can be used as a remedy, as a solution uh, for Chinese Buddhism. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Master Taishi observed that uh, during the late Qing and the uh, early Republican period, a lot of Buddhists thought about Buddhism and tend to associate Buddhism with death, funeral rites, and also other worldly salvation. And by early worldly salvation, they're talking about, you know, one of them being very pessimistic, wanting to, you know, chant the Buddha's name and go to the Western Pure Land, or as, or as people put it, you know, just Nian Fu Wang Sen, and don't care about what, you know, what's going on in, in this world. So Master Tai Chi was very against uh, this idea of, of uh, uh, over emphasis of death and funeral rites, and also thinking only about otherworldly salvation. It, he actually thought that it's important to practice human life Buddhism, which he thought could be used to address the social and spiritual problems of 20th century China. So he thought that human life Buddhism was extremely important, and Buddhists should practice Buddhism in their human life and not thinking about death or only otherworldly salvation. And more importantly, as I mentioned, he attempted to change the image and understand of Buddhism as a religion for the day. Because again, there's a lot of emphasis about death and right. So he wanted to want the Buddhists to practice Buddhism for this worldly life. He wanted Buddhists to practice Buddhism not because they want to go some other you know pure land, but practice Buddhism to make this world a pure land. So practice Buddhism for this world. So this is a very interesting kind of idea. And this very interesting concept that was very different from what was being you know, promoted and practiced by many Buddhist temples and organization uh, at the time. But more importantly, he wanted to promote this a utopian idea of establishing a pure land on earth or and he thought that having this pure land on earth is more important because this is something more immediate and uh, this is something more important than only thinking about attaining rebirth in the other transcendental pure land so this is something that he wanted to you know to promote at that time but of course uh, it was not easy for him uh, to do that because he thought that to do so, they, uh, the Buddhist community need to revitalize, need to reform Chinese Buddhism. And this was a lot of work to do. And according to Master Tai Chi, by to do so, uh, Buddhist community had to uh, had the institutional reorganization, reorganize the, the, the kind of uh, Buddhist institution and structure instead of having you know just monasteries to uh, to conduct uh, uh, ceremonies and rituals he, he he thought that it's important to have Buddhist organization to propagate the Dharma and so one of the things that you know that he promoted was actually to build Buddhist lecture halls and auditoriums or you know or like Jiang Tang to propagate the Dharma and not temples to only promote ceremonies and rituals. Another, of course, important thing that he promoted was this modern education. He thought that Buddhist monastic should be trained in modern Buddhist education. And that was the, one of the reasons why he came out with this. Uh, he promoted the uh, and supported the establishment of Buddhist Institute of Fo Shui Yuan to promote modern Buddhist education. And also he was, uh, he placed a lot of emphasis also on the idea of Buddhist compassionate social action. And by Buddhist compassionate social action, he was actually talking about how Buddha should be involved in charitable activities and, uh, and also contributing to society and how Buddha should not be pessimistic or anything about the other worldly salvation, but should contribute to this, uh, to the to the community and help others. So this is something that he thought was very important. And finally, he also suggested that Buddha should have this ecumenical cooperation in a global mission. And that was also one of the reasons why he established the World Buddhist Fellowship, because he thought that Buddhist communities should be connected and contribute to this global mission of making the world a better place, and also to, to connect and to contribute to the propagation of the Dharma. So that's the reason why he actually came up with these ideas to revitalize Chinese Buddhism. And also he was considered what uh, Professor Don Pittman, as you can see uh, over here, this is a very important book. He, he actually suggested that Master Tai Chi was an ethical pietist, and by ethical pietist, he actually suggested that how uh, Master Tai Chi actually encouraged individual piety and leading a vigorous Buddhist life. In other words, he, uh, Master Tai Chi wanted Buddhists to, to practice Buddhism in their life and not only 
practice Buddhism, you know, when someone dies and then you know, invite monastic to chant. So it's very different from the kind of Buddhism that was more popular, um, that was, you know, uh, that people actually thought about at the time. So he was actually considered a very revolutionary thinker of his time. And of course, uh, what Master Tai Chi uh, wanted was that how Buddhist action, uh, or religious action uh, at the core of spiritual practice and spiritual transformation. And in other words, Buddhists should put their, action, put their practice into action and not only uh, practicing Buddhism, uh, practicing a religion, just you know, uh, something as very separate from their everyday life. So in other words, what he wanted to do is to make Buddhism relevant to one's everyday life and relevant to the modern society in Republican China at that time. And uh, last but not least, he wanted Buddhists to be socially responsible, as I, I mentioned earlier, how Buddhists should have this compassion and social action to contribute to the community. And he thought that this action is actually fundamentally interconnected to the transformation of the social order. So if Buddhists are being uh, you know, uh, socially uh, responsible and socially uh, you know, uh, involved in society, their action can contribute to the transformation of the social order and make the, the, uh, the society a much better place. So he has this very idealistic uh, vision of what human life Buddhism can do to China at that time. But of course, it's very important to note that uh, he was uh, he had such wonderful ideas uh, during his time, but he was actually not very well supported by many Buddhists uh, in Republican China. In fact, some of them thought his ideas were too, uh, too radical. And uh, there were also uh, some of the more conservative monastics that were against his idea of a human life Buddhism. And in fact, from some of the sources that I came across, Master Tai Chi at that time, he actually started a very influential magazine known as Hai Chao In, which is still uh, in print today. Uh, so the Hai Chao In magazine was one of the very important magazine and platform for Master Tai Chi to promote his idea of human life Buddhism. And of course, uh, that magazine, interestingly, was actually banned in some Buddhist uh, temples at that time because some of the conservative monastic thought that uh, Master Tai Chi's idea were too radical and inappropriate to, uh, to the monastic. So in fact, some temples actually banned his Hai Chao Yi magazine. But of course, gradually, uh, Master Tai Chi was able to influence a younger generation of monastic during his time as the rector of the uh, Mingnan Buddhist Institute. And he uh, trained a generation of Buddhist thinkers and reformers to carry out his ideas. Uh, so Master Tai Chi uh, came to Singapore to promote his ideas of uh, human life Buddhism. So he actually made three visits to Singapore. The first time in 1926, second time in 1928, and finally in 1940. So he came to Singapore during his first visit that was in September 1926. Master Tai Chi came to Singapore I gave a series of talks at the Victoria Memorial Hall. And of course, uh, uh, if you have some Singaporeans in the audience, you're probably very familiar with the Victoria Memorial Hall, which is one of the national monuments in Singapore. And the Victoria Memorial Hall at that time in colonial, in colonial Singapore was a very prominent uh, place, a space for not only for uh, uh, kind of music, uh, for a performance, but also it was a very important hall for important lectures. So Master Tai Chi was invited to come uh, by the uh, overseas Chinese community in Singapore. And he was uh, asked to give a series of lectures at the Victoria Memorial Hall, which were very well attended by many Buddhist and prominent overseas Chinese leaders at the time. And during one of his lectures, he promoted the establishment of a lay Buddhist association in Singapore. Because at the time in Singapore, most of the Buddhist institutions were actually mainly Buddhist temples and uh, monasteries, and there were very little activities for the lay Buddhists. So Master Tai Chi thought that it's very important to engage the lay Buddhists in, in Singapore and therefore suggested the need to, to establish a lay organization. And he is taught, his lecture inspired uh, Ning Dayun, a prominent Buddhist householder in Singapore. And Ning Dayun was one of the very prominent overseas Chinese leaders 
And as you can see uh, in this image, he's a university graduate. So you, as you know, back then, not many people were that, not many overseas Chinese were that well-educated or influential. So he was one of the very prominent leaders at that time. And uh, he actually uh, supported uh, Master's tai Chi, uh, Master Tai Chi's idea and established a lay Buddhist organization. And the lay organization, uh, he, in 1927, a year later, he, uh, Ling Da Yun, with the support of Venerable Zhuang Dao, who was a prominent monk at the time in Singapore, and Venerable Zhuang Dao was the founder of the prominent uh, Guamingsan, uh, Guamingsan Pogasi Monastery, or the Guamingsan Pujie Chansi in Singapore. And uh, Ling Da Yun got, uh, managed to, uh, to get uh, Venerable Zhuang Dao's support, and he founded the Chinese Buddhist Association, or uh, Zhonghua Fu Jiao Hui, in Singapore. And uh, it's still around and as you can see, uh, this photograph that I took uh, just a few months ago, uh, the Chinese Buddhist Association or Zhonghua Fu Jiao Hui became the first lay Buddhist organization in colonial Singapore. And more importantly, it was located in Singapore's Chinatown. And of course, why it's so important that it's in Chinatown? Because that was the place that most overseas Chinese were residing in Singapore at the time. So that's why it's a very strategic location for, for, for the organization to reach out to the Chinese community. And the uh, Chinese Buddhist uh, Association played a very important role in promoting Tai Chi's idea of human uh, life Buddhism. And of course, it was a center for the promotion of the so-called Buddhist revital movement in, uh, in colonial Singapore at that time. And of course, the... Uh, the Chinese uh, Buddhist Association uh, provided Buddhist education and started to uh, offer uh, Dharma lectures, but more importantly, welfare services for the overseas Chinese community that were, uh, that, uh, that were residing in Chinatown. So it was became a, not only an important religious, but also a social and community organization for the Chinese uh, in, uh, in colonial Singapore. But Tai Chi had a much more, uh, much more grander kind of vision for Singapore, right? So, uh, so he uh, thought that, well, with the establishment of this Chinese uh, Buddhist association, he thought that, well, they, he actually should establish a Nanyang Buddhist association or the Nanyang Fu Jiao Hui to achieve his ecumenical vision you know, of a Buddhist uh, collaboration you know, a network in Southeast Asia. So he thought that, uh, that uh, he should organized uh, and connect regional Buddhist uh, uh, organizations uh, to connect to in order to connect three maritime Southeast Asian countries, uh, including the Dutch East Indies, which is uh, present day Indonesia, uh, and at the time British Malaya, which is uh, the Malay Peninsula, and uh, of course Singapore. He thought that because of Singapore's uh, strategic uh, geographical location, because Singapore at that time in colonial Singapore was a very uh, was a very prosperous, connected global port city. He thought that the headquarters of the uh, uh, Nanyang Buddhist Association should be established in Singapore and as a center for this uh, ecumenical kind of Buddhist networks uh, in Southeast Asia. And, and of course, he wanted the Singapore to serve as a regional hub for Buddhist missionary activities, and more importantly, as a center to promote this idea of human life Buddhism. But unfortunately, uh, and uh, but unfortunately, his idea to connect this maritime Southeast Asian state to the international Buddhist network was never materialized. So although he had this you know, wonderful idea, unfortunately, he, 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 uh, it wasn't exactly realized. But this is something that he, he had in mind. And that was something that he thought was very important for Buddhist organizations to be connected in this international Buddhist network and also to collaborate in the propagation of the Dharma. So, uh, and of course, one of the very important things for Master Tai Chi uh, was actually to, to bring his important disciple, which was uh, Master Tsi Hang, uh, to Singapore. So, uh, Tsi Hang, Master Tsi Hang was a student of Master Tai Chi. Uh, in 1940, uh, Master Tai Chi uh, invited Tsi Hang along for his tour of Asian countries. So, at the time, uh, that was after the, the uh, outbreak of the Sino Japanese War in 1937. So, Master Tai Chi actually uh, embarked on this global Asian uh, uh, global uh, tour in order to promote this idea of Buddhist vision of world peace uh, against this kind of Japanese aggression 
But more importantly, it was also a, a way for him to actually uh, to connect with other Buddhist community and promote his idea of human life Buddhism, which he thought was so important at the time, especially in times of war, that how Buddhist human life Buddhism can contribute to world peace. So he actually went on this global tour. And of course, a uh, part of the tour was to actually visit the different Asian countries. And uh, during his 1940 tour, he brought along uh, his student, Si Han, and after the tour, uh, Tai Chi returned to China, but uh, Ci Han wanted to stay in Singapore to promote human life Buddhism and to propagate the Dharma. So he uh, stayed in Singapore and he actually founded the Lingfeng Buddhist uh, Buddhi Institute or Lingfeng Puti Xueren and the monastic dormitory or the Ba Si Liao in Singapore to, to uh, support Buddhist monastic to learn the Dharma. And of course, uh, if you are familiar, I am going to share with you more late, uh, uh, later that how the Lingfeng Buddhi uh, Institute later on became the Lingfeng uh, Prashna Auditorium or the Lingfeng Forum Jiang Tan under uh, uh, Venerable Yen Pei's leadership that I'm going to tell you more about later on. So you, uh, other than you know, from, uh, establishing a Buddhist institute to uh, educate Buddhist monastic, he thought that Buddhist education was very important. So Master Han founded the Maha Bodhi School or the Puti Shishak in Singapore. And of course, some of you uh, who are in Malaysia, uh, uh, if you are from Penang, you might be familiar with uh, the, uh, the uh, Porte School or the Puti Shishak in Penang that was uh, established a bit earlier. So in fact, they were they are actually part of this uh, Puti Shishak network. And, uh, and um, Master Chi Han actually also contributed to the expansion of the uh, Porte School in, in Penang. So he was actually moving between Singapore and Malaysia to propagate the Dharma. And so this is a very uh, interesting photo of uh, Master Tai Shi's visit to Singapore in 1940. As you can see in this photo, this is Master uh, Tai Shi over here, and uh, Master Chi Han is over, uh, right over here, and this is Master John Dao. So as you can see, that uh, by the 1940s, uh, there's actually already a quite a vibrant Buddhist uh, community uh, in Singapore, and they were very supportive of this idea of human life Buddhism. So uh, Master Chi Han, after staying in, uh, in Singapore for a few years in 1948, uh, Venerable uh, Miao Guo invited Chi Han to become the founding rector of the Taiwan Buddhist Institute or the Taiwan Fortune. So therefore he accepted the invitation and he left uh, Singapore for Taiwan. And subsequently he founded the, uh, the Maitreya Inner Hall or the Miller Nei Yue in Xizhi. In fact, I was just there uh, this summer for some research. And it's very interesting uh, uh, that uh, in the uh, in the Mila uh, uh, internal hall, the, uh, Master Chi Han actually taught the Dharma uh, in the Maitreya Inner Hall uh, in uh, in Xizhi, Taiwan, in Taipei uh, until he passed away in 1954. But more, what's most interesting is that after he passed away, his body did not decompose. In, in fact, he became the, the the very first uh, what uh, what's called it's called Buddhist mummy. But uh, you know, is Buddhist mummy sounds kind of funny, you know, if you think about that. Even in the kind of Egyptian mummy kind of context. But in the Chinese Buddhist context, they call him the Rosen Pusa, just like you know the the six patria liu zu hui nan, that uh, the body did not uh, decompose, and, and in fact, uh, Master Chi Han became the very first uh, Rosen Pusa uh, uh, in in Taiwan. And if you have a chance to visit uh, Mila Nei Yuan, I, I really encourage you to go. You should really take a look at the museum, and of course, uh, have a look at you know at, uh, at uh, have a look at the image of uh, of Master Chi Han who was a very prominent. Uh, a teacher and promoter of human life Buddhism, right? So now I'm going to move into the second phase of uh, uh, Buddha, humanistic Buddhism in Singapore, and I'm going to learn about uh, Venerable Yen Pei. And Venerable Yen Pei is one of the monks that I talk about in my uh, recent book that, uh, that Dr. Tan mentioned earlier, that is uh, Monks in Motion. So in Monks in Motion, uh, I actually look at three prominent Buddhist monks that promoted uh, Buddhism in Maritime Southeast Asia. And I talk about uh, uh, Venerable Zhu Mo in uh, Malaysia, uh, Aqing Jiara, in Indonesia and uh, and of course uh, Venerable Yen Pei in Singapore. So Venerable Yen Pei was in fact one of the most prominent socially engaged Buddhist monks in post-colonial Singapore. And he was in fact uh, involved in the promotion of modernist Buddhist ideas and in fact humanistic Buddhism. And he was also actively involved in promoting Buddhist welfare works in Singapore. So he was a very important uh, uh, teacher of the Dharma, but he was also a very important uh, 
a, a promoter and supporter of Buddhist welfare services that you're going to learn more about later on. So Venerable Yenpei, just like uh, many of the early uh, Buddhist pioneers in maritime Southeast Asia, the, he was born in China uh, and studied in China before they came to Southeast Asia. So Venerable Yenpei was born in 1917 in Jiangsu, and he actually traveled south to Xiamen to be enrolled in the Mingnan Buddhist Institute that you learned about earlier. So in fact, the Namputo Ministry and its uh, Mingnan Buddhist Institute was a very important intellectual center for the Buddhist community in South China during the Republican period. So Venerable Yen Pei heard about you know, the, uh, the, the uh, Mingnan Buddhist Institute and he thought he wanted to study there. And because back then, after he was ordained, his teacher at that time wanted him to become the abbot of the monastery, but he was not keen to do so because he wanted to further his studies. So therefore, he actually went against his, his uh, master's uh, uh, idea, his master's plans for him to actually become a Buddhist scholar. So he traveled south to study in Xiamen, and he had the chance to study with uh, uh, with some of the very prominent Buddhist teachers at the time at the Mingnan Buddhist Institute, including, of course, Master Tai Chi, where he was very influenced by the idea of human life Buddhism. And uh, of course, uh, he became a student of Tai Chi, and he, he uh, was very influenced by this idea of human life Buddhism. But later on, he became a student of renowned Buddhist thinker, Master Ying Sun. And of course, Master Ying Sun was in fact a student of Master Tai Chi at the Minnan Buddhist Institute. So in other words, uh, it's very interesting that on the one hand, uh, uh, Venerable Yen Pei sees uh, Master Ying Sun as, uh, he, as he's one of his teachers. But in other words, uh, Master Ying Sun was also uh, Venerable Yen Pei's senior at the Minan Buddhist Institute. So he's like the kind of the Xue Zhang in a way who graduated uh, a few cohorts before uh, Venerable Yen Pei went to the Minan Institute. So it's very interesting to think about the Minan Buddhist Institute in a way like a university where you know you have the alumni networks and kind of connections as well. So Venerable Yen Pei was very influenced and he became a student of uh, Master Ying Sun and became very influenced by uh, Master Ying Sun's idea of humanistic Buddhism or Ren Jian Fu Jiao. And uh, Master Ying Sun, of course, he, as I mentioned earlier, he was a student of Master Tai Chi and was very influenced by the idea of human life Buddhism. But he later on went on to further his study to, and he became uh, interested in drawing on sources and documents and, uh, and scriptures of Indian Buddhism. And he realized that how humanistic Buddhism even existed during the Buddha's time. And in fact, he claims that Buddhism in early India had degenerated when it became assimilated with theistic religious tradition. But more importantly, he actually thought that humanistic Buddhism existed during the Buddha's time. And therefore, as he, he argues that how, as the Buddha attained enlightenment and taught the Dharma in the human realm, the human should practice Dharma and strive to achieve Buddha who in the human realm, and that is the essence, as he, he suggests, of humanistic Buddhism or Ren Jian Fu Jiao. And therefore, he promoted this idea of humanistic Buddhism or Ren Jian Fu Jiao, and he suggests that how human should aspire to practice the Buddhist path or the Pusata of the great vehicle of the Tachan in order to enter the Buddha vehicle or in order to enter the so-called Fu Chen in his in his interpretation of humanistic Buddhism. And also he pointed out that in his very important work known as the way to Buddhahood or Chen Fou Zi Dao, he emphasizes the uniqueness of the Mahayana, which uh, he calls it the Da Chen Bu Gong Ba, how the Mahayana spirit, the Bodhisattva path is unique and essential uh, to practice Buddhism in, in this human world in order to enter the Buddha vehicle, to enter the full term. So this is his interpretation and understanding of, of humanistic Buddhism. And of course, this idea greatly influenced uh, Venerable Yen Pei's understanding and vision of humanistic Buddhism. I'm going to show you the very interesting uh, short oral history interview about uh, Venerable Yen Pei's uh, encounter uh, with, uh, with Master Ying Sun. Tang 
，要我们旁听，同时指定我们呢，跟应顺套师呢，立求一的法法。Yes, so, ah.、Uh... Venerable Yen Pei actually、uh, studied with、uh, Master Ying Su actually at the Sino Tibetan Institute,、uh, actually during the Sino Japanese War. So, at that time, during the Sino Japanese War, the Japanese occupied the coastal region in, in China, and the Kuomintang government、uh, retreated、uh, to Chongqing. And in fact, the Buddhist community actually retreated uh, to, uh, to the inner part of China along with the Kuomintang government at that time. And with the retreat from the coastal The region, the Sino-Tibetan Institute or the Hanzhang Foshuyuan, became a very prominent Buddhist institution during the Sino-Japanese War. So, in fact, Master Tai Shi and、uh, Master Ying Sun were actually at the at the Sino-Tibetan Institute, and、uh, that was the time when Venerable Yen Pei、uh, actually studied with、uh, Master Ying Sun. And of course, he was greatly influenced by Ying Sun's idea of humanistic Buddhism. And in 1949, after the end of the Chinese Civil War, many the Kuomintang government retreated to Taiwan, and many prominent Buddhist monastics actually went to Taiwan with the、uh, with the、uh, along with the Kuomintang government. And that was the time that、uh, Venerable Yan Pei and Master Yin Sun also thought that they should leave a、uh, communist China at that time in 1949. But they did not go to Taiwan immediately. They first left for Hong Kong. And then subsequently, they went.、Uh, they joined some of their other monastic friends in Taiwan. And after going to Taiwan, Venerable Yan Pei became the abbot of the San Dao Monastery, or San Dao Shi in Taipei. I don't know how many of you. I, I don't know if you are familiar with the San Dao Monastery in in Taipei. In fact, it's one of the uh, the uh, MRT station. So if you want to go there, you can take the MRT to San Dao、uh, Temple Station. And once you go out, it's the, the San Dao Monastery. And of course, San Dao Monastery is one of the very prominent、uh, monastery in Taipei. And、uh, and at that time,、uh, one of the very prominent uh, 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 some of the very prominent Buddhist teachers were actually based in Taipei at that time, and they wanted、uh, a prominent teacher to become the abbot. And at that time, Yin Pei was actually asked and invited to become the abbot, and he reluctantly agreed. And the reason was because actually Yin Pei at that time wanted to further his studies in Japan, but unfortunately, because of uh, uh, unfortunately, he was asked to be the abbot, and he could not do so. And he served as the abbot in San Dao Monastery from 1957 to 1960, as you see,、uh, can see from the photograph below. And、uh, and of course, more importantly, uh, he actually uh during his stay uh during his time as the abbot of the uh San Dao Monastery, he was actually invited to give um Dharma talks in Southeast Asia、uh, in the late fifties and nineteen sixties, and he had、uh, opportunities to go to many uh to both mainland and maritime Southeast Asian countries, including to Vietnam, Thailand,、uh, Malaysia, and Singapore, and in fact. At that time, Venerable Yen Pei was very drawn to the Buddhist community in Vietnam. In fact, the Vietnamese Buddhist community really loved him. They actually wanted him to come and establish a temple in Vietnam, and he was very keen. So at that time, he was he was actually、uh, telling Master Ying Sun, as I could see from from the sources, that how he actually wanted to go to Vietnam and to propagate、uh, humanistic Buddhism to the Vietnamese.、Uh, Buddhist community, but unfortunately, he was unable to do so in the 1960s because of the Vietnam War. And in fact, in in his、uh, autobiography, he talked about there were actually some bombing, and、uh, you know that、uh, things were not very politically, you know, unstable in Vietnam. So eventually, his good friend, a、uh, venerable、uh, Guang Chia.、Uh, In the Singapore, ah,、uh, Guang Chia Lao, ah,、uh, Lao Ho Sang actually, ah, Guang Chia Pa Si invited, ah,、uh, Venerable Yan Pei to to come to Singapore, and then he thought that, ah,、uh, yeah, probably that's a good idea, and eventually he accepted his friend's suggestion to settle in Singapore and be and to become the abbot of the Ling Feng Prashna Auditorium, the Ling Feng Pura Jiang Tang, and as I mentioned earlier, ah,、uh, the Ling Feng Pura Jiang Tang was initially established by ah、uh, Master Cihan. Uh, 
uh, in uh, in the 19, uh, 1940 uh, when he came to Singapore. And uh, and of course, uh, Venerable uh, Yen Pei was very excited with the idea because of course, Venerable Yen Pei sees himself as a student of Master Tai Chi. So uh, he of course saw uh, Master Tsuhai as kind of his, you know, like his shirts and his senior. Uh, and of course he thought that it's a great idea for him to, to become uh, to, to be the successor, to be the abbot of the Ling Fong National Auditorium that you know that Master Tsai established. So he became the abbot. But more importantly, he transformed this Ling Fong National Auditorium into a, an auditorium, a lecture hall, a jiang tang, to be to propagate uh, Buddhism to, to, and to propagate his idea of humanistic Buddhism. So he was a very active Dharma teacher, and he was a promoter of humanistic Buddhism during his time as the abbot of the Ling Fong National Auditorium. And you renovated the auditorium, and you see from the image here. In fact, uh, if we look at the image here, you do you might not think about this uh, this uh, auditorium as being very modern. In fact, uh, 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 you know it looks kind of Chinese style because we have now so many even more modern looking Buddhist uh, temples today. But in fact, if you look at this uh, auditorium, it was actually considered extremely modern during the 1960s. Because back then, Buddhist temples in the 1960s you are, is really the kind of temple, uh, the kind of architecture, Chinese architecture style. You see a lot of dragons and picnics, uh, you know, in the, on the roof and, you know, very, you know, a lot of carvings of, you know, the Buddha, Bodhisattva and Araha. And, and of course, uh, Venerable Yepe was not interested in any of that. He wanted to make this auditorium very simple, as you can see in the image, and as a place to propagate the Dharma. So he's not interested to have a, you know, very very Chinese looking, very elaborate kind of monastery to conduct ceremonies. He wanted that to be a center for Buddhist studies in Singapore. And more importantly, uh, he was a very prolific Buddhist teacher and a writer. So in fact, he produced a 34 volume of collected essays. It's, it's uh, uh, known as the Collected Works of Mindful Observation of Yi Guan Quan Ji that was published. And subsequently, uh, he actually published another 12 volume of his uh, works known as Yi Guan Shi Ji, making him, the, in fact, the most prolific Buddhist teacher, uh, Chinese Buddhist teacher in Maritime Southeast Asia. So he's actually prolific and, you know, he taught a lot of students and of he wrote a lot of uh, important essays and lectures that were published as part of his collected works. And this is a, 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 a an image that I created showing that how uh, that uh, Venerable Yen Pei's Ling Fong Prashna Auditorium became a very important center for, uh, for the transnational Buddhist networks because he actually invited from the sources that I came across, he actually invited Buddhist monks from all over the world to come to teach, uh, to give lectures at his Ling Fong Prashna Auditorium. He invited Buddhist teachers from Taiwan, including a venerable master, uh, Sing Yun, master Ying Sun, his teacher, uh, Venerable Sun Yen, uh, you know, uh, Venerable Bison, many prominent teachers from Taiwan to come to, uh, to come and speak in Singapore. He also invited prominent teachers from uh, from Hong Kong, China, and uh, Malaysia, and in fact also from uh, from Australia, Canada, and in fact the, uh, in the, from the US. So he, he was in fact trying to make his uh, auditorium a global hub for Buddhist studies uh, in. Uh, uh, in the 1960s and 70s. So this is very interesting to think about this kind of global transna uh, transnational uh, network that he tried to create. And more interestingly, uh, in by in the uh, in the late 1970s uh, and early 1980s, Yen Pei uh, managed to make his Ling Fung Prashna Auditorium a very important center for Buddhist studies. And of course, uh, he thought that it's time for him to move on to do something important. And in the early 80s, Venerable Yen Pei became a citizen of Singapore. So, uh, and then he, he thought that as a, as a citizen of Singapore, he should contribute to, to Singapore society. And as a firm believer of humanistic Buddhism, he thought that how Buddhists need to be more socially engaged and contribute to the society. So that's the reason why uh, he handed the Limpo Prashna Auditorium to his good friend, uh, Venerable Longkan, and 
he decided to establish in 1980 the Singapore Buddhist Welfare Services or the Singapore Fuji of Fuji Xie Hui to help the lower income group in Singapore society. And that is a very important uh, institution, not only for the promotion of Buddhist teachings, but also an important Buddhist welfare organization that actually supported the Singapore society in three major areas, which is first, elder care and in fact, filial responsibility. Second, organ donation and kidney dialysis. And third, drug prevention and rehabilitation. I'm going to talk more about this. Right. So during this time in the 1980s, it was actually a very time of big social political changes. After Singapore became independent in 1965, Singapore embarked on the uh, rapid development in Singapore. And of course, Singapore's ec uh, you know, economic development uh, you know, happened very quickly. And by the 1980s, Singapore became one of the very wealthy uh, Southeast Asian countries and later on became what is known as the one of the four Asian tigers or four Asian dragons, the you know, si Xiaolong. So it was uh, becoming a, you know, a, a very prosperous uh, Southeast Asian country. But yet on the other hand, Yan Pei realized that there are also many poor and elderly Singaporeans that actually fell through the cracks, that they did not actually benefit from the rapid economic development and how the Buddhist community should contribute to look after them. So he actually, in fact, highlighted that how many needy elderly were living below the property line in the 1980s and how he, the Buddhist community should play a role in supporting the, the needy elderly. And so therefore, uh, he also argued that how Buddhism is a religion that places utmost importance of filial piety. Uh, as you see, you can see over here in this article, he, said, he says that uh, 佛教是最终是孝道的宗教, because he also promoted this idea that how Buddha should play an important role in taking, looking after not only one's elderly parents, but also looking after others' elderly parents and the elderly in the Singapore society. So he let, therefore let the uh, Singapore Buddhist Welfare Services act, uh, active uh, effort in promoting public assistance. And uh, he uh, started this uh, project that actually uh, had volunteers conducting value regular house visits and in fact offering uh, food and other necessities to the elderly. So they were actually trying to play an important role in, uh, in looking after the, the, uh, the elderly in Singapore. And in 1985, he actually founded the Grace Lodge or the Si Enling as, a, as a, a shelter for homeless elderly because he thought that many uh, some of the elderly, they were just so poor they even could not afford their own housing. So he actually established this uh, elderly shelter to take care of them. And uh, at that time, Yen Pei was also an active champion of organ donation. And this was one of the things that the government was actively promoting in the 1980s. And the government at the time was uh, trying to promote this idea of organ donation for people, you know, uh, if they die of uh, accident, they should actually donate their organs to help others. And, and uh, Yen, Venerable Yen Pei was very supportive of this government initiative and idea, and he became a champion for organ donation. And in fact, he believed that such donation was in line with the Buddha's teachings of compassion and loving, uh, and loving kindness. And in fact, as I quote here, he mentioned, as I quote, Buddhism encourages all Buddhists to donate kidney or other useful internal organs to the sick. A uh, Buddha should participate actively in the launching of kidney donation, and could, as you see over there. So he was a very active supporter of that. And later on, uh, he actually organized a kidney donation seminar and, uh, in fact, a five day kidney care exhibition at the, at the time of the Singapore World Trade Center in 1983 uh, to actually promote this idea of organ donation, not only to the Buddhist community, but to the general Singaporean public. And uh, in 1992, uh, Yen Pei uh, founded the Singapore Buddhist Welfare Services and the Singapore Nas uh, National Kidney Foundation Dialysis Center that you can see over here on the right. And it became the first Buddhist National Kidney Dialysis Center because that's when he realized that many poor kidney patients, uh, they are not able to, uh, to pay for the very expensive uh, medical uh, care to, uh, for kidney dialysis. So therefore he decided to establish this to help kidney patients to, uh, uh, to offer more affordable uh, medical services to the kidney patients. 
And in fact, uh, so the National Kidney Foundation has a research grant for, uh, it's known as the Vulnerable Yenpei NKF Research Fund. Of course, this research fund is named uh, in the memory of the, of the vulnerable to support kidney research. So if any of you is conducting any research on, on kidney, uh, on, uh, on, on, uh, on uh, uh, renal uh, medicine, you know, or kidney disease, you can uh, consider applying for this research grant. <laughs> and last but not least, Mumpei was concerned with the problem of young drug addicts in the 1970s. And that was one of the social issues that the Singapore government uh, was very concerned about. And Yenpei pointed out that how Buddhists should be sympathetic to former drug addicts. Uh, and in fact, he actually argued that, uh, that Buddhists should help them to actually overcome their psychological and material instabilities because he thought that if they are not able to uh, overcome the psychological and material instabilities, they can never overcome their drug addiction. So therefore, in order to help them with the drug problem, they need to help them with other psychological and material issues that, uh, that, you know, that can really be beneficial to them. So, and because of that, he established the Green Haven or the uh, Qing Song Yuan, which actually is the first and only Buddhist halfway house in Singapore. And uh, the Qing Song Yuan uh, is a very important a Buddhist halfway house to support uh, uh, former drug addicts to help them uh, overcome their drug addiction, but more importantly, help them to reintegrate uh, into the into society. So this is a very important initiative that Yen Pei uh, came up with. So the Qing, the Green Haven provides a six to 12 month long residential rehabilitation and treatment program for former drug addicts uh, by not only helping them with, uh, you know, to overcome their drug addiction and also, uh, you know, to help them, you know, overcome their psychological and material instability. It was also an important uh, welfare institution that helped to introduce them to, to the Dharma, to help them, uh, to help them, you know, uh, to uh, get better support, better spiritual support to help them overcome their kind of drug addiction uh, problem. And more importantly, the, the uh, Green Haven also helped former drug addicts to return to their family and reintegrate into society. And this is one of the very important aspects of, uh, of uh, helping uh, uh, in, in terms of drug rehabilitation. So this is a very uh, interesting image. On the left, you see a very, uh, this is from the Singapore Buddhist Welfare Services website showing that how uh, the, uh, the kind of the history and transactory of the uh, Singapore Buddhist Welfare Services is, is established in 1981 uh, to uh, 2019. So it's a very interesting kind of info map. But I want to point your attention to it is this uh, poster on the right, which was the uh, the uh, poster of the uh, of the uh, memorial uh, ceremony uh, last uh, last November to celebrate the uh, uh, to commemorate the twenty fifth anniversary of the passing of Venerable Yen Pei. So of, even though he has passed away for you know for twenty five years, but he remains uh, well loved and uh, in the memory of many Buddhists in Singapore, right. And uh, finally, uh, I'm going to turn your attention to the humanistic, uh, to humanistic Buddhism in contemporary Singapore. And uh, one of the ways to think about uh, humanistic Buddhism in contemporary Singapore is to actually think about this emergence of reformist Buddhism. And this is from uh, Professor Kwa Kun Ng's very important book, State, uh, Society and Religious Engineering to a, a Reformist Buddhism in Singapore. And th in this very important book, uh, uh, Professor Kwa actually argues that how in the 1980s, there was this Buddhization of Chinese religious syncretism and a movement towards reformist Buddhism within the Chinese community. And she actually pointed out that the reformist Buddhists in Singapore engaged in six main types of religious activities, and uh, namely first, propagating Buddhist scripture knowledge to the general public, Second, encouraging general participation, encouraging Buddhists to participate in Buddhist uh, activities. Third, 
cultivating committed reformist Buddhists and of course cultivating them through of course Dharma classes and Dharma activities to make them uh, uh, to be uh, involved in uh, Buddhist uh, in the Buddhist uh, organizations. Fourth, performing missionary work, of course, uh, contributing to the propagation of the Dharma. Fifth, putting faith in real life practice and action, uh, that is uh, making Buddhism relevant to this worldly life. And, and of course, this is something that I talked about earlier. And of course, last but not least, legitimizing visa as a public holiday. And of course, Buddhists in the past do not really see something that is as important as today as you as you notice that in uh, in many parts of uh of southeast asia but in fact in many places now visa is becoming a very important kind of public holiday for the buddhist community so this is something interesting to think about and our first professor Kwan mentioned that in the secular domain how reformist buddhists were actively engaged in charity and welfare work so they were actually contributing to the society in terms of their buddhist philanthropic activities However, uh, she did not actually talk much about humanistic Buddhism in her book, and therefore I actually wanted to uh, want to propose that in fact the propagation of humanistic Buddhism uh, can be considered as one of the very important factors that contributed to the, this reformist Buddhist movement in Singapore, especially since the 1980s, and how human Buddhist, humanistic Buddhist organizations, monastic and lay leaders play a very important role in in uh, in promoting this kind of, I would say, six main type of Buddhist religious activities, as well as promoting charity and welfare work in Singapore, and especially if you think about that in the contemporary Singapore context. So, uh, and it's actually interesting to note that uh, in the third phase of this uh, development of humanistic Buddhism in Singapore, many of these organizations actually came from Taiwan, but then gradually localized and became you know, uh, uh, a part of the Singapore Buddhist uh, commu community. And of course, I want to start uh, by uh, talking about the, the uh, I'm going to talk about three uh, Buddhist, uh, humanistic Buddhist organizations that are active in Singapore to give you uh, an idea about what are some of these organizations. But of course, there are many more humanistic Buddhist organizations in Singapore, and because of you know of time constraint, I'm not able to cover every single organization in my talk. So I'm going to talk about three main organizations. First, the Maha Prashna uh, the Buddhist Society. Uh, second, uh, of course, Fo Guang San Singapore, and third, I'm going to talk about Siji. Right. So let's start with the Mahaprajna Buddhist Society. In fact, the Mahaprajna Buddhist Society, I would say, was the first uh, Taiwanese humanistic Buddhist group to, to uh, in fact, no, not, uh, not to, actually, no, Mahaprajna Buddhist Society did not exist in Taiwan. It was actually came in uh, Venerable Ho Zhong that I'm going to talk about now, came to Singapore, and then he established this Mahaprajna Buddhist Society. Unlike the other two uh, organizations that I'm going to talk about later, they were actually prominent Buddhist temples, uh, organizations in Taiwan, and then they, they came to Singapore to establish half the, uh, the kind of local branch, all right? So for Venerable Ho Zhong, he was a disciple of Master uh, Ying Shun, and uh, he was, uh, we, he actually studied at the Fuyan uh, Vihara, the Fuyan Jingse in, uh, in Xinzhu, which is one of the very prominent uh, Buddhist center for Buddhist learning in Taiwan uh, that was established by Master Ying Sun. And later on, studied at the Huiwe Auditorium that, of course, are uh, again established by Master Ying Sun in Taipei. But these are two of the very important uh, Buddhist uh, organizations that are actually established by Master Ying Sun to, to promote Buddhist uh, research and education. So, Venerable Ho Zhong was a student of Master Ying Sun, and he later on decided to come to Singapore to propagate humanistic Buddhism. And in, 1990, in 1985, he came to Singapore and he founded the Mahaprajna Buddhist Society. And according to, uh, to the Mahaprajna Buddhist Society, uh, there were a few reasons why uh, they thought it was very important to, uh, to establish this uh, Buddhist organization to promote humanistic Buddhism. First, uh, as you can see over here, and I quote, that temples were many uh, and devotees abound, but in actual fact, there is no distinction made between Buddhism and Taoism or Buddha and deity. And this was one of the issues that, in fact, many 
Buddhist teachers encounter in the earlier days of trying to promote uh, Buddhism in Singapore that many uh, Chinese uh, Buddhists do not actually make the distinction between Buddhism and Taoism and, and between the Buddha and deity. And that is what some people call Senfo Bufen, you know, kind of tell the difference between Buddha and deity. And in fact, what well, about uh, religious worship is that you know, the more gods uh, you worship, the more merits, the more blessings you get. You know, the, the kind of saying that by the sun to sun bao you, you know, kind of idea. But this is a kind of a common kind of uh, misconception kind of, uh, you know, of, uh, of Buddhism. You know, uh, and because of that, vulnerable Ho Zhong thought it's very important to, to actually uh, to educate the Buddhist uh, community in Singapore. And that was why he founded the Mahaprajna Buddhist Society. And was another reason he, that he actually observed was the lack of Buddhists with talents and leadership quality in various sectors of the society posed many problems, as very problems for the Buddhist community. Their very lack of uh, lay teachers, especially to teach the Dharma classes, their lack of Buddhist uh, monastic to run everything. So in other words, uh, there's a kind of a common saying uh, even till today that there are not that many monastics. And very often the mon monastics uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the local Buddhist temples need to bow kale out. They need to do everything because there are just not that uh, enough uh, people in the leadership uh, position, especially back then. So because of that, uh, the Mahaprajna uh, Buddhist Society played a very important role in training lay Buddhist teachers and lay leaders that can help to run the organizations. And, uh, and more importantly, as what they pointed out, that it was actually most of the traditional Buddhist temples at the time in the 1980s were kind of conservative in their outlook and seldom organized the right activities to attract new followers. Of course, we learned about the kind of Ling Fung Prashna Auditorium and you know, Singapore Buddhist Welfare Services that Venerable Yen Pei established. But those organizations, in fact, were not that common, in fact, uh, back in 1980s, even then. So that's the reason why Venerable Ho Zhong thought that it was important to have more Buddhist organizations to organize Dharma activities and also organize the right kind of activities to attract new followers, to make them interested in Dharma. So the Prashna Buddhist uh, society propagates humanistic Buddhism based on Master Inch's idea of the, the way to Buddhahood, uh, Chenfu, Zidda. And of course, the curriculum, uh, they have a very rigorous uh, Dharma course curriculum that is uh, over across three years, divided from beginner, intermediate, and advanced level. And for people, for Buddha, uh, for the uh, students who after graduated from the advanced level, they can even go on to further, uh, uh, for their further study this. And of course, one of the very important aspects of this Dharma course curriculum is to actually train Buddhist teachers that can help to run some of the activities and classes at the Maha uh, Prashna Buddhist Society. So they have a very organ uh, effective organized system to train the next generation of, uh, of Buddhist uh, leaders and teachers. And this is the, the, the three years uh, Dharma uh, program. And in fact, uh, Vulnerable Ho Zhong has in fact uh, made yeah, the, the, the courses available online. So uh, in fact, if you are interested, you can even go online to look at, you know, to go through this three-year program uh, virtually. So it's very interesting to, to, to see how uh, with the advancement of technology, now uh, Buddhists can even attend Dharma classes online uh, even uh, for an extended period of time. And in addition, the Mahaprajna uh, Society also tried to organize activities that, uh, that are quite different from the uh, so-called traditional Buddhist temples at the time. So of course, other than the Dharma talks to propagate uh, the Buddha's teachings, they share organized social welfare act uh, activities to support uh, the, uh, the, uh, the wider Singaporean community. So have, they have like blood donation drive, they have a charity drive to uh, do to, to help the poor. They have an interesting fora arrangement, uh, classes, choir, and in fact, Tai Chi uh, class as well. So uh, they are introduced quite a, a wider range of activities to actually attract uh, more, uh, more uh, interested uh, followers. And this is the poster of the uh, the most recent this year's Dharma class uh, recruitment. Unfortunately, the deadline uh, you know it has closed. The class just started uh, last month in July. So if you want to enroll you know in the Dharma class, you have to uh, wait for <laughs> one more year, or you can do it virtually online, right? Uh, of course, another very prominent. Uh, 
uh, Buddhist organization in Singapore that probably needs no introduction uh, is, of course, Fogwan San Singapore. I, I'm, I'm sure some of you probably, you know, are very familiar with, uh, with Fogwan San and, of course, uh, Fogwan San's branch in Singapore. And in 1993, the Singapore chapter of uh, Buddha Light International Association, or uh, the, uh, the BLRIA, the Guoqi Fogwan Hui, was established in Singapore to propagate, uh, to propagate humanistic Buddhism. And of course, uh, uh, for the, uh, in 1996, the Fo Guang Yuan was founded. And in fact, I have very fond memories of uh, Fo Guang Yuan. Well, I remember I used to go there when I was uh, in, uh, in middle school, in, well, in secondary school and in high school. Uh, and at that time, uh, many of my friends and I loved to go to the cafe, the Di Sui Fang at uh, Fo Guang Yuan uh, before, uh, uh, before uh, the uh, Fo Guang San Singapore was actually uh, established and moved to the current location in Pongo. So with the establishment of Fu Guangyuan, uh, Master uh, Sin Yuan uh, often uh, you know, regularly visited Singapore to propagate humanistic Buddhism. As you can see, the, uh, the image on the right, that was uh, one of uh, Master uh, Sin Yuan's uh, Dharma propagation event, uh, and he actually at the time, uh, Fo Guang San invited uh, Singapore's uh, Prime Minister Li Xianlong, as you see in the image, as the guest of honor. So it was a extremely uh, there were many well uh, attended events that were organized to propagate uh, humanistic Buddhism. And in two thousand, uh, the Fo Guang San Singapore was officially registered and completed in October two thousand seven. And as you can see, the image on the right that is the uh, Fo Guang San Singapore in uh, in present day uh, Pongo. And I I, I hope uh, some of you will have a you know a chance to visit. Uh, if you have not done so, hopefully you, know, you can visit in the near future, <laughs> right? And uh, the Fukuang San Singapore uh, aims to be an education institute for the community and a sanctuary for uh, spiritual cultivation to propagate humanistic Buddhism. So, of course, uh, Fukuang San, uh, some of us you are very familiar with, is a very important, uh, one of the very important Buddhist organizations uh, in Taiwan that uh, that promote humanistic Buddhism. And of course, the Master Sing Yun has established branches, Fukuang San branches all over the five continents. Like, uh, you know, uh, and uh, Singapore has, uh, of course, a very active uh, uh, branch uh, as well in, in Fogangsan, Singapore. And the uh, Fogangsan, Singapore uh, focuses on four activities, uh, namely propagate the Dharma through culture. So there are a lot of cultural activities that uh, Fogangsan, Singapore organize. And of course, one of the main platform is actually to use culture as a way to propagate the Dharma to promote humanistic Buddhism. But more importantly, foster, uh, the second activity is to foster talent through education. So as I mentioned earlier, one very important aspect of uh, humanistic Buddhism is through the promotion of uh, Buddhist education. And of course, Buddhist education is a very important platform to foster talent, to foster the young, the next generation of Buddhist teachers and leaders. And of course, this is one of the, the, the activities that Fogang San Singapore you know, has been uh, very actively, uh, you know, been, have, have uh, has actively engaged in. And of course, besides that, uh, another activity is to benefit society through, through charity. So uh, for instance, Singapore has also contributed to uh, charitable activities in Singapore, helping uh, you know, the uh, Singapore community. And of course, another uh, important aspect of it is the spiritual aspect. So of course, Buddhist organization, in fact, humanistic Buddhist organization plays a lot of emphasis on Dharma propagation, but and also education. But of course, they are also actively involved in, in uh, Dharma services in terms of providing spiritual support to their, to, to their followers. So this is one or another very important activities that uh, for one son Singapore uh, is, uh, is uh, engaging in. But uh, more interestingly, and this is something that I, you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, that uh, Fogang San Singapore uh, started a very successful uh, humanistic uh, uh, Buddhist youth forum that has been running for many years. And uh, of course, uh, the most recent one was in December last year. And of course, this is uh, the uh, the uh, the recent the image of the, uh, this was the, the in-person uh, youth forum in 2019. And, uh, and of course, because of COVID-19, things have you know, moved uh, online. So the, the forum last year was conducted virtually. I wonder if you can find me in this picture. <laughs> that, uh, of course, uh, hopefully uh, the Buddhist, uh, this humanistic Buddhist youth forum will, 
uh, would be uh, conducted face to face again, hopefully. And uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, as I always tell, you know, my colleagues and, and uh, students that you know that of course you know online learning is great. You know, you don't need to wake up early and go to class. You know, <laughs> uh, you can just wake up ten minutes before the, you know the start class. But nothing beats you know really face to face interaction and you know, face to face uh, kind of learning. So uh, I really look forward to uh, you know, to uh, seeing the uh, humanistic Buddhist. Uh, Buddhism you forum back uh, in a kind of in, uh, in, in person. So yeah, uh, very much looking forward to that. And last but not least, another prominent uh, humanistic Buddhist organization in Singapore is uh, Ciji Singapore. And uh, of course, again, Ciji um, also needs no introduction. It's one of the most prominent uh, Buddhist organizations in Taiwan, and it has also spread, uh, the, it has also expanded to uh, to, uh, to various countries all over the world as uh, one of the most prominent Buddhist charitable organization. And Ciji came to Singapore around the same time as Fo Guang San. It was registered in 1993. And at the beginning, uh, Ciji actually held their activities at the Bao Guang Fo Tang in Singapore, which is, a, a, I would say, quite a small nunnery, uh, Bao Guang Fo Tang, that actually promoted humanistic Buddhism. And of course, the Abbas of uh, Bao Guang Fo Tang, Venerable Hui Qi, was a disciple of uh, Master Ying Shun. And of course, the founder of Ciji, Venerable uh, Zhen Yan, was also also a disciple of Master Ying Shun. So, and because of that, uh, Venerable Hui Qi actually supported Ci Qi in the, uh, in the early beginning and also allowed the activities to, uh, allow the Ci Qi members to conduct their activities uh, in, her, in her temple. And uh, subsequently, uh, in 1997, the Ci Qi Cultural Center was established. The Ci Qi Cultural Center uh, subsequently, in 1998, it was renamed the Buddhist Compassion uh, Relief Ciji Foundation, uh, and it was actually relocated to Chinatown. Again, Chinatown is a very important uh, place in Singapore. Not only you know, it's a tourist attraction, but it's a very prominent uh, historical place, and it's also a place where there's actually many uh, needy elderly. So that was also one of the reasons why Ciji Foundation decided to uh, establish their uh, Compassion Relief Foundation in Chinatown to actually provide uh, care to needy elderly residents in the Chinatown area. And, and in 2005, Ciji Singapore's uh, Jing Si Hall or the uh, Jing Si Tang was completed and they was actually moved to the, the eastern part of Singapore, uh, close to uh, Pasiris. And um, the Ciji uh, Singapore established an an island-wide network of volunteers, and of course, one of the of course the volunteers are play a very important role in sharing the Dharma, and of course, Ciji uh, uh, also is one of the organizations that promote humanistic Buddhism and also promotes the teachings of Master Yingxun and a Venerable Zhen Yan. So the, the volunteers play a role in, in uh, sharing the Buddha's teachings with the you know the general uh, public. But more importantly, they see themselves as the uh, as a Buddhist charitable organization. So the uh, the volunteers play a very important role in uh, promoting philanthropic activities, reaching out to the elderly and the needy. And in, in Singapore, they also play a very important role in promoting recycling in Singapore. And this is something very interesting that, uh, in fact, many Buddhist organizations in, in Taiwan, uh, including uh, Fo Guang San, uh, Dharma Drum, and Ciji, they have all uh, been very actively in promoting recycling and of course recycling is a big thing in Taiwan. But then in Singapore, this is something quite new to many Singaporeans. So in the more recent years, the government is uh, in a way supporting more, uh, is putting in more efforts to encourage Singaporeans to play a role in uh, in recycling uh, and uh, and to build a more sustainable environment. And of course, Ciji is one of the very prominent organizations that helping uh, in this effort in promoting recycling in Singapore. And in 2019, the Ciji Humanistic Youth Center was established in, in Yishun. And this is one of the, the largest Buddhist youth center to be established in Singapore. And of course, at the, uh, this, the, on the right as a, at the opening uh, ceremony, the minister Shamugan was invited to be the guest of honor to, to open the, uh, the humanistic uh, 
uh, youth center, uh, which is uh, aims to uh, play an important role in not only uh, promoting the Dharma to the youth, but also uh, as an important center to promote, to encourage youth volunteers to contribute to Buddhist charity. So this is one of the initiatives that they are trying to promote. So I'm going to end my uh, lecture uh, today by very quickly, uh, I'm going to summarize uh, uh, what I've just shared with you. Uh, my lecture today looks at the history and development of humanistic Buddhism. And you have looked at, uh, you know, I have shared with you how uh, human life Buddhism that was established, that was, idea was promoted by Master Taishi during the Republican period, gradually developed. And today as what we now know as humanistic Buddhism, you know, uh, uh, around the world. And how we can understand, how we can, you know, look at the, the history of humanistic Buddhism in three phases. First, the 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 uh, the early the, the first phase, which was the time of uh, Master Tai Chi and his idea of human life Buddhism, and how he came to Singapore to promote the Dharma, and how uh, he inspired Ming Da Yun to establish the Chinese Buddhist Association, and subsequently how his disciple Master Tsihan came to Singapore and contributed to the establishment of the the Lingfeng Puti Xuerian and uh, and the uh, and the uh, and the Puti uh, and the Puti Mahabuddhi School. In the second phase. I share with you about the uh, about the uh, the arrival of Venerable Yen Pei and how Venerable Yen Pei contributed to the propagation of humanistic Buddhism in Singapore. First, by establish by uh, expanding the uh, Lingfeng uh, Brashna Auditorium as a center for the promotion of of, of uh, Buddhism, and second. And with the establishment of the Singapore Buddhist Welfare Services to promote Buddhist charitable and philanthropic activities. And last but not least, in the final phase, I share with you how Taiwanese organizations came to Singapore, including uh, the Mahaprasna Buddhist Society uh, by Werner uh, uh, Ho Zhong, as well as uh, Fogang San Singapore and of Siji Singapore, and how this organization came to Singapore. But more importantly, is to think about the localization of humanism. Buddhist organizations, how although these ideas you know, came, uh, humanistic Buddhist idea you know, was first formulated you know, in Republican China, spread to Taiwan, and later came to Singapore. We also should think about how humanistic Buddhist organizations later on became localized and to, to cater to the needs of the Singaporean community. And finally, I think uh, something important to think about is to, uh, and this is something for future research, is so we can consider and think about the impact and long-term development of humanistic Buddhism in Singapore, how the humanistic Buddhism contributed to the propagation uh, of the Dharma, to the, uh, the wider uh, promotion of Buddhist education, and how it actually changes the religious landscape in contemporary Singapore, I think is something that is worth, worth you know, exploring further. So with that, I will stop here, and I look forward to your, your questions. Thank you.